for the 7th Congressional District. Um, with us this morning, we have um, Peter Jacob, who is the challenger, and um, will be standing to my left. So, Peter, why don't you come on up? And Leonard Lance, the incumbent congressman for the 7th Congressional District. So before we get started, I want to go over some ground rules so that everybody here understands how this is going to operate and actually to also remind the two candidates. So each candidate is going to be, given, be giving an opening statement um, that will last for three minutes and then a closing statement also for three minutes. Um, the order in which they are going was decided by a coin flip. Now, we are going to be asking questions on five different topics related to the economy. Um, these topics were provided to the candidates in advance, but not the specific questions that will be asked. Each candidate will have three minutes to answer the question. Each candidate will then have two minutes to either rebut their opponent um, or be asked a second question. The timekeeper um, will hold up a yellow card, and the timekeeper is right there in the front, when you have 30 seconds left. When your time is up, she will hold up a red card. So please finish up your comments when you see the yellow card, not the red card. <laughs> so the, um, the candidates are asked to answer the questions that are asked. I know that sometimes they give any old answer that they want, um, but we hope that they will answer the questions that we ask this morning. Um, finally, I would like to ask the audience to refrain from getting overly excited and clapping, yelling, or making rude noises, because after all, we're just talking about economics. You know, how exciting can that be? Um, now, I would like to um, say a few words of thanks before we get started. Um, first, to the campaign managers, John Malone and Josh Levine. John is campaign manager for Leonard Lance campaign, and um, Josh for the Jacob campaign. And if you two could just kind of identify who you are. Thank you very much. They both did a tremendous amount of work to put this on this morning. Um, I would also like to thank my staff, and in particular, Bedisa Rai, um, who is also this morning's timekeeper. Our videographer to morn this morning is Kaz Bielan from Premier Media. So we will, we are um, recording this, we are live streaming it on the overflow room, and we will have this up on YouTube by the end of the day. So if you want to see it, you can go to our website, gatewaychamber.com. I know that both campaigns are also live streaming to Facebook um, right now. But I also, Kaz Bieland from Premier Media, is our small company of the year um, this year. He's just been named that. So he does a lot of work for the chamber and um, is a really terrific videographer. And then finally, I want to recognize the Holiday Inn. Putting this on this morning was a challenge, to say the least. And the Holiday Inn has been great at accommodating us, helping us get everything set up. You have to understand that we usually expect a much smaller crowd than is coming this morning. And so we did not plan to have this many people packed into um, to the room, but it really does show the excitement um, that, that we are going to have. So um, based on the coin toss, um, Congressman Lance will be making the first opening statement. Mr. Lance. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jim, and uh, good morning to you all. Uh, first, I would like to thank the uh, Gateway Chamber of Commerce. This is the third general election debate in which I have participated with the Chamber of Commerce as the host. I also participated in a primary election debate several years ago before this Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Gateway Area Chamber of Commerce has been a mainstay of this part of New Jersey for 105 years. 
uh, having first been established in 1911. And Jim does a terrific job, as, the, as does the Board of Directors. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in thanking the Gateway Chamber of Commerce. Um, I note in the audience municipal officials, uh, and I also note the presence of my successor as the minority leader in the State Senate, State Senator Thomas H. Kane, Jr. Thank you for being with us this morning, Senator Kane. I said to Tom when he became my successor as minority leader in the State Senate, may the same thing happen to him that happened to me. May his brown hair turn gray. Uh, the principal issues in a campaign for Congress, in my judgment, are the state of the American economy. And we're going to be discussing those issues this morning and how to move the nation forward regarding making the economy stronger for all Americans. This is a discussion in which I am engaged in the Congress of the United States. I think it is the principal area of helping make the nation a better nation. There are also issues related to foreign policy, but today we will be discussing issues related to the state of the economy. I'm very proud of my record in Washington. I serve on the oldest committee in the House of Representatives. The House Energy and Commerce Committee that was first established in 1795 it is the committee of greatest jurisdiction in the House. No freshman is permitted on that committee. I was honored to be able to join that committee as a sophomore in Congress. And it is the committee that deals with important issues affecting the economy of the 7th Congressional District, including uh, the pharmaceutical industry, the healthcare industry, the medical device industry, the telecommunications industry. I'm the only Republican east of the Alleghenies to serve on that committee, and I am certainly involved in the major issues based upon the economy of the United States, so critical to moving forward. It's an honor to represent the 7th Congressional District, 75 municipalities here in North Central New Jersey, in Union County, Essex County, Somerset County, Morris County, Warren County, and Hunterdon County, where my wife and I live out in Clinton Township with the mailing address of Lebanon. I'm joined by my wife, Heidi, this morning, who is the love of my life. And certainly, we are honored to be with you, and I am honored to serve you in the Congress of the United States. Thank you. Um, so if you could please refrain from clapping, uh, Mr. Jake. First, I'd like to thank the Gateway Chamber of Commerce and all the organizers, Jim and his team, for putting on this wonderful debate. I want to thank Congressman Leonard Lance for participating in this debate. Thank you, Congressman. And I want to thank each and every single one of you for being here this morning. Let me start off with a story. My parents came to the United States from India in 1986, and when they arrived, they just had $20 in their pockets, hearts full of hope, and a six-month-old baby in their arms, me. They were able to establish a small family business. We do security systems, alarms, and cameras. They purchased a beautiful home in the township of Union, right here in Union County. They were able to put their children through college, and I was able to get my master's in social work from Washington University in St. Louis, the top-ranking social work program in the country. I came back home the very next day after graduating because I knew I wanted to serve here. And as a social worker, although the faces and the voices were different, the stories remained the same. The families who had to work two or three jobs, who had to take pay cuts to keep those jobs after the recession, but still did not make ends meet. Our veterans who served our nation, but ended up jobless, homeless, and suffering from PTSD. Our senior citizens who literally had to choose between food and life-saving medication every week. And although many of us are not in these dire conditions, we see the challenges all of us face. Our infrastructure is crumbling. Our roads, our bridges, our waterways. The bridge in Rocky Hill is still out. And there's a road to nowhere in Hillsboro. Just traversing down 78 and 22 like Congressman did this morning, you could see our roads are in dire despair. I was out in uh, Warren County yesterday, and there's much need for broadband, internet, and wireless connectivity. The, the gateway tunnel, we need to end that delay. We saw what happened in Hoboken earlier this month when a train derailed. It is no wonder why the American Society of Civil Engineers downgraded us from a C to a D. The AFL-CIO to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to the IMF have all stated that we need to invest in our infrastructure. And when we talk about infrastructure, we cannot neglect building this infrastructure environmentally friendly and sustainably. Folks, climate change is not a hoax invented by the Chinese, as Donald Trump states. 
It is a reality. And there's one candidate who stands here who unequivocally opposes the Penn East and Pilgrim pipelines. We have some of the leading solar panel integrators in all the East Coast right here in the state of New Jersey, including our 7th district in Flemington. But we can't address these challenges. We can't address gun safety. We can't address uh, health care education without getting to the crux of the issue, and that is our broken campaign finance system. There is a tsunami of money that floods the pockets of politicians and drowns out the voters' voices. For far too long, special interests have been put above the public's interests. And as a son of immigrants who was raised in a small business and as a social worker, I am that public servant to return the public back to public service. Let's make a democracy and an economy that works for each and every single one of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jake. Please, no clapping. Um, you are going to be given the first question. This question is on the overall state of the economy. President Obama has been saying in recent months that the economy is going great. Unemployment is below 5%. We have had seven years of growth. The stock market is at an all-time high and inflation is low. Why is everybody complaining? On the other hand, polls show that 65% of the American people think the economy is headed in the wrong direction. They are not feeling the recovery the president is talking about. So what is the state of the economy and are we on the right track? Without a doubt, I think we're better off today than we were eight years ago after the Great Recession. But the reality here is that people, wages have been stagnant for the past 30 years. Meanwhile, the wages of the wealthiest CEOs in this country has rose a thousand percent. The top 1% of people have more wealth than the bottom 90% combined. People are working longer hours for less wages. We need to ensure we have a democracy and an economy that works for all of us. And the way I believe we do that is with proper investment into our communities. I support the Rebuild America Act, which will put 13 million people to work in various capacities, in construction, engineers, uh, people to build those supplies. I believe in what we call the virtuous cycle, uh, a concept that Robert Reich, the former uh, Secretary of Labor um, has envisioned. When people have money, people have dollars going into their pockets, they're able to take that money, whether it's through investment in infrastructure, whether it's raising the minimum wage to a livable wage. And every time in history we have raised the minimum wage, and we've done it 50 times since the Great Depression from 1930 onwards, including under Harry Truman, who nearly doubled the minimum wage, with the opposition saying, hey, look, it's going to ruin our economy. Guess what? Businesses did better, people did better. When people have money, they not only save, but they spend back into our economy. That money goes into small businesses. Those businesses are able to hire more workers. Tax revenues go up, and all that is used. It's a cyclical cycle. We need strong investment, and we need to be leaders when it comes to the Green Revolution. This is the home of Thomas Edison, but we're falling behind Denmark and India and Costa Rica. We call it the Garden State. We need to live up to that name. That is why I believe we could create, literally put the people working in green, the green energy sector and increase jobs by 10 million. I'm not joking, but we need the right leadership. And that's why I support the Clean uh, Energy Act. I support also the American Clean Energy Act to transition workers who work in the fossil fuel industry to working the clean energy sector. But we can't do this alone. We need the right leadership in our U.S. Congress to get this done. Thank you. Mr. Lance, the same question. Are, is the economy going great, as President Obama says, or are we not on the right track? Uh, I do not think that the economy is going great. I certainly think the economy is in better shape than it was when President Obama became president. And it is true that under uh, the last eight years, we have had an increase in employment, and I want to give credit where credit is due. I think President Obama is partially responsible, and I think the Republican-led Congress is partially responsible. And there have been more jobs created in the last eight years than in the prior eight years under President Bush, but not nearly as many jobs as were created under President Clinton in his two terms in the 1990s or under President Reagan in his two terms in the 1980s. More important from my perspective is the labor participation rate in this country. 
and it is at an historic low. I think it's 62.9%. Uh, it was 3.5% higher 10 years ago in December of 2006. And 3.5% regarding the labor participation rate is dramatically higher 10 years ago and dramatically lower now. In other words, many Americans have given up looking for jobs. And so what must we do moving forward with a new president and a new Congress to make sure that the economy grows stronger? I think we need fundamental tax reform, both at the individual level and at the business level. I think we want, want to make sure that uh, we create the type of jobs that the American people need and want. We want to bring profits from abroad, from companies that have earned profits abroad, back to this country to create strong American jobs. We have a tax system in this country that is different from most other major economic powers. Other countries have a tax system where you pay taxes where the profits are earned, then you can bring the profits back home to create jobs. That's not our tax system in this country. We need a system to be competitive with nations across the globe, particularly rising economies such as in India and in China and in other places as well, in Europe. And I think that that would be a boon to make sure that we create strong American jobs. We also need to retrain the workforce community colleges and other areas so that the jobs that are available are the jobs that are important for the 21st century. Um, I want to work with whoever is elected president. I want to make sure we're sure that we move forward in a positive manner so that we can be the beacon of hope economically. I do not think we are that today. I think we must make sure we do better in the future and I'm committed to doing so. Great. Thank you. Mr. Jacob, would you like to comment on Mr. Lance's response? Yes. I think a fundamental thing we need in this country to ensure that we have the jobs and the workforce ready to take up those skills needed for the 21st century is through investment in infrastructure. I believe in fully funded public colleges and universities and vocational programs. This is something I want to remind everybody we had in this country. This is not a question about should we do it, we need to do it. I always ask folks, uh, which country profits the most from the production of the iPhone? You know what everyone's response is? Nine out of 10 times, China. The reality is Germany, Germany uh, profits the most from the production of the iPhone because they have tuition-free public colleges and universities and vocational programs preparing people to do, utilize the technical skills needed in the 21st century. The National Association of Manufacturers estimates that we will have um, Two million, two million unfilled manufacturing jobs in the United States by 2025. We could address this. We could be leaders in this field, but we need the right workforce. We need the next generation to have opportunities. We need my generation to have something to look forward to. We need the next Elon Musk. We need the next Tesla. We need the next uh, leaders when it comes to green energy, and we could do it right here in the Garden State, and that's the investment I want to bring back to the 7th District. Thank you. Mr. Lance, would you like to comment? Uh, I certainly favor uh, greater investment in infrastructure, and that is why I voted for the bill that has recently passed, a bipartisan bill regarding transportation and infrastructure needs. Uh, it was, I think, a very good bill, reasonably funded, and I'm pleased that it passed in a completely bipartisan way. And I think that's the way we should operate in Congress. Um, and incidentally, that bill did contain uh, initial funding regarding the tunnel that is needed between us here and New York and I favor the building of the arc tunnel I think it's critical it will take roughly 20 years to build but we must get started on that it's critically important to this congressional district because this congressional district is a commuter district with many of our residents uh, commuting into New York it's one of the reasons that we have fine communities along the rail line and I am committed to making sure and it will take time that the ARC Tunnel is built. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to discuss tax policy. Mr. Lance, you will have the first question. Donald Trump has proposed a substantial reduction in income taxes, both personal and corporate. It is estimated that these cuts could increase the national debt 
by between $2.5 and $5 trillion over the next 10 years, depending on what type of analysis you use. As someone who consistently speaks out against the national debt, do you support Mr. Trump's tax proposal? Uh, I do not support it in its current form. I think that we should reform the tax system, but I would hope that a President Trump might look to our proposals on Capitol Hill, particularly the proposals from the House Ways and Means Committee, chaired by my friend uh, from Texas, formerly chaired by the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. And we have put forth proposals. Um, uh, what I favor is a simpler, fairer, less complicated tax system for individual rates. Uh, our top rate at the moment is 39.6 percent and um, Hillary Clinton proposes that that rate increase. I am definitely opposed to increasing rates as Hillary Clinton has suggested, but I do not want to have a situation where we exacerbate the federal debt. And this is based upon my experience in uh, the state legislature before I went to Washington. I am New Jersey's leading opponent of borrowing without voter approval. Uh, I sued uh, Governor McGreevy on that issue and won in our state Supreme Court in the case of Lance v. McGreevy and later my constitutional amendment prohibiting further state borrowing without voter approval became the law of New Jersey in our fundamental document, the state constitution. Uh, I try to be a fiscal hawk in Washington as well and I am not going to vote for any proposal that I think further exacerbates the federal debt, which is now $19 trillion. When uh, President Obama first became president, uh, in his first year in office, the annual deficit was $1.4 trillion, and in his second year in office, the annual deficit was $1.3 trillion. These were enormous sums of money. This was when the Democratic Party controlled both houses of Congress as well as the White House. When Republicans took control of the House of Representatives after the election in 2010, uh, we worked in conjunction with the President and now the annual deficit has been reduced to roughly $500 billion. It's still too high, but we're moving in the right direction. And I'm not going to vote for any proposal uh, to raise taxes, as Hillary Clinton suggests, or any proposal, including a proposal by the Republican candidate for president that would further exacerbate uh, the federal debt. I think we need a fairer, flatter tax system, and I hope that we can work on that next year. And regarding business taxes, I certainly think that we need a territorial system whereby you can bring profits from abroad back home to create strong new American jobs, and I would like to see a lowering of the corporate tax rate. It's now the highest in the industrialized world at 35 percent. I would like to see it go down. I do not want to uh, um, exacerbate the debt, but I think it would create American jobs and therefore bring tax revenues into our coffers. Right. Thank you. Mr. Jacob. Hillary Clinton has called for a large income tax increase on those who make over $250,000 per year. This amounts to the top 5% of households nationwide. New Jersey has the highest household income in the United States, however, and the 7th Congressional D District in particular has a high concentration of families earning over $250,000. New Jersey is also one of the most expensive places in the country to live, and as a result, the burden of her increase would fall disproportionately in your district. Would you support Mrs. Clinton's tax plan and why? In reality, the tax plan put forward by Secretary Clinton and looking at the numbers would not affect 90% of households, nearly 90% of households within our own 7th Congressional District. There's over 260 households within our fighting 7th Congressional District. Look, here's the reality about taxes. The last time we had such great economic inequality in this country was on the eve of the financial collapse in 1929. Now, economic inequality is actually greater today. We need a fair taxation system. We need people to pay their fair share. I pay my taxes. My family, our small business, we pay our taxes. And you know why we pay our taxes? Because we care about our neighbors. We care about our communities. We care about our schools and our roads and so on. There are corporations out there. And Congressman Leonard Land said we need to bring down the tax rate for many of these big corporations. 
The reality is many of these corporations have gone years without paying taxes. From 08 to 2013, several corporations, big industries in telecom and pharma, paid zero dollars in taxes. Zero dollars in taxes. Yet their profits keep going up. And then they stash money overseas. There's $2.3 trillion in overseas bank accounts in Bermuda and the Cayman Islands that are going untaxed. If we tap into that, that's $7 billion brought back home, $7 billion. The fossil fuel industry gets away with subsidies that we, the taxpayer, pay them. Banks borrow from, from the taxpayer at 0.75%. Do you know how much I'm paying back my student loans at? 6.55%. Why is it a debt sentence to try and make it into the middle class? And I'm not that bad off compared to some of my friends or President Obama who is still paying his student loans into his 50s. The reality is we need a fair share tax system. And when we had that between the 1930s and 80s, we had a bottom-up approach when it came to economics in this country. Businesses did well. Workers did well. We built the inter interstate highway system and we put a man on the moon. That's what a fair taxation system gets you. I want a progressive taxation system. The challenges are far too great, and we cannot ignore what we are facing when it comes to education, when it comes to our economy. At this point in our nation's history, we need a fair taxation system so that the wealthiest CEOs or the wealthiest companies who have all their capital here, who have 100% of their capital here, shouldn't be able to stash it in Ireland and then defer it uh, to other places and not pay a penny on those deferred um, uh, inc um, revenues that are made in other nations. What we are talking about is ensuring we have a democracy and an economy that works for all of us. We need to put people first. Mr. Lance, would you like to comment on uh, Mr. Jacobs' yes, response? Yes, I, I certainly would. I, I take that as a yes for Mr. Jacob that he uh, favors Hillary Clinton's proposals that would raise taxes and this would have a disproportionately adverse effect on constituents here in the 7th Congressional District in New Jersey. Uh, this is the most affluent of the 12 Congressional Districts in this state. And uh, her policies would lead to higher taxation for residents here in the 7th Congressional District. Uh, and we already pay enough taxes and I don't want to raise taxes on anybody in this Congressional District. We do have a graduated tax system in this country uh, the top rate is 39.6%. Hillary Clinton's proposal would increase it. Her proposal would also increase death taxes. Very important to small businesses and to family farms. We had a compromise in Washington, and I supported that compromise uh, regarding uh, the federal estate tax. Bipartisan in nature, signed into law by President Obama, and now Hil Hillary Clinton says that she wants to revise that I think she wants it to go down 30% from where the uh, tax kicks in right now. She would reduce that 30%. That would be very harmful to family farms in this congressional district, particularly out in Hunterdon and Warren counties, and to small businesses throughout the district. I go to small businesses all the time, and I want to make sure that small businesses are able to to prosper. Seven in ten new jobs that will be created in this country will be created by small businesses. I am opposed to Hillary Clinton's tax increases. I want to make the tax system fairer, flatter, with fewer rates. I do believe in closing loopholes. Everybody should pay his or, fair, his or her fair share, but I think we can do that without raising taxes in the United States. Mr. Jacob, would you like to comment? Yes. Like I said, this will not affect any households making less than $250,000 a year. Um, when you talk about death, quote unquote, taxes, the reality is it's an estate tax. An estate tax won't be affecting anyone but the 0.03% of Americans, 0.03% of Americans. That's a very, very small amount. When the wealthiest corporations do not pay their taxes, you know who that impacts? It impacts my family's business. When the wealthiest corporations don't pay their taxes, it affects all of us. That's the reality here. Because they get away with the loopholes that are so big that Arnold Schwarzenegger could drive his Hummer through it. That's how large those loopholes are. The reality here is that we need a tax system that ensures that 
we pay our taxes as well as we need a Congress. We need public officials that take those tax dollars and not hand out subsidies and not give corporate handouts, make sure those are reinvested into our communities. I've gone around the 7th Congressional District. I've talked to people from Union County all the way out to Milford and Hunterdon County, the small mom and pop businesses in Westfield. And you know what they say? They're not looking for handouts. They just want their fair share. They just want to make sure that they are able to do business in their communities. But they're not able to do it if the wealthiest companies get their subsidies, they don't get to profit from that. And the biggest companies end up being conglomerates. They eat up uh, smaller companies. We see what's going on with AT&T and Time Warner merger. That's going to affect small businesses, their access to internet, they, their ability to do business. That affects our economy overall. We need to ensure we protect small businesses. And that is making sure that, yes, they need support. They need access to capital. They need uh, small banks to be supportive of, of their efforts. But we need to make sure everybody pays a fair share amount into the system because we don't see a return on our investment when we pay our taxes. And I'm at that congressman. When you pay your taxes, you could guarantee that we will build our roads, our bridges, and our communities. Okay, let's move on to trade policy. Mr. Jacob, you will have the first question. Uh, both Mrs. Clinton and Mr. Trump have spoken often and forcefully against international trade and, in particular, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Trade restrictions, however, hurt the consumer by keeping prices high and limiting choice. It is estimated that, with trade restrictions, high-income earners lose 28 percent of their purchasing power, while the poorest 10 percent lose 63 percent of theirs. At the same time, trade restrictions protect very few jobs. Do you support your candidate's position? Yes. I oppose the TPP and the TTIP. Uh, I think it will be harmful to our economy. Um, we see the impacts of NAFTA now. Uh, the reality is I'm not opposed to international trade. It's necessary. We live in a globalized world. We need to do business with folks. But we can't do it by sacrificing the average worker. We need to ensure before we do any trade deal, and we get into trade uh, deals with other nations, we have to ensure that we invest properly uh, in the policies. We have the fiscal policies in place to protect the everyday, everyday worker throughout our own nation. Jobs will be lost left and right. You know, TPP is what they say is NAFTA on steroids. Um, I think we have to seriously consider the impact of trade. Uh, we need to ensure our workers are protected as well as have the skill sets necessary. I think we went too quickly from manufacturing to a service industry way too quickly. It is perhaps the natural evolution of economies such as ours, but sometimes we do it way too quickly. It sacrifices workers. It disables small businesses. It harms them at the end of the day because the only folks who actually uh, benefit from trade are the wealthiest big corporations that write these laws in the first place so they could get away with um, having monopolies on various industries. Uh, and the small businesses in our downtowns from Union Center to Flemington, they're the ones that are harmed. We see that every day. We've seen that for the past 20 years. Mr. Lance, same question. Do you support Mr. Trump's calls for trade restrictions? Uh, I am basically a free trader, but I believe we have to have fair trade, and I do not support the TPP. I have uh, read a summary of it, and it's only because it's been made public recently that I could look at it and the provisions that are in it. Uh, regarding uh, the agreement with Pacific nations, and this does not include China, it includes other nations in Asia, but I think some in the public are confused that this is a trade agreement with China. It is not. It's with other nations in Asia. Uh, Hillary Clinton stated that it was the gold standard of trade agreements in Australia and in Singapore, and you are welcome to look at her statement. But she has changed her mind on this, and she has changed her mind on this based upon the challenge she received from Bernie Sanders. Uh, she is opposed to it as of now, and Donald Trump is opposed to it as of now. The President of the United States supports it, and I think he may try in lame duck to have it passed. 
I have stated publicly as recently as last night in a telephone town hall that I held, my 42nd telephone town hall, in direct answer to a question that I will oppose it if I see it in lame duck. I don't know whether the president will bring it up to Capitol Hill because whoever his successor is, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, either one of them opposes it. Now what would I do moving forward? That trade agreement has to be renegotiated and it is important for the new president, whoever he or she is, working with the new Congress based upon our views, representative of the American people, to negotiate a fairer trade agreement with these Asian nations. Specifically, we need greater protection of intellectual property rights in that agreement. And one of the principal reasons I oppose it, having read a summary of it and analyzing it, and I didn't take a position until I saw it because I wanted to see it first, one of the principal reasons I oppose it is that it does not have strong intellectual property rights to protect American businesses and American industries, particularly the pharmaceutical and medical device industry, so critically important to this congressional district. There are more pharmaceutical and medical device employees in this congressional district than in any other congressional district in the United States. There is also a great deal of telecom in this congressional district. And the intellectual property rights of those industries with so many employees in the 7th Congressional District in North Central New Jersey would be jeopardized by that uh, agreement. And so I think we have to do a much better job. Our trade negotiator has to do a much better job beginning in January to negotiate a better treaty. I think it's possible, but of course I think Congress should be intimately involved and I hope whoever is president will select as the trade negotiator somebody who is tough on this issue. Mr. Jacob, would you like to respond to Mr. Lance or would you like a follow-up question? I could respond to that question. You know, the reality here is if we look at the history of trade and I'm very much tired of the political posturing in down in the Beltway. The reality with trade is, look at NAFTA, for example. NAFTA first came up and it was discussed under Reagan's administration. It was drafted under George H.W. Bush. Sure, it was pla passed under Clinton, but it was passed under a majority Republican ru rule within the House. Same thing 10 years later with CAFTA, roughly. CAFTA was passed with a majority Republican rule in the House. And it will be no surprise to me when Republicans in the House pass TPP. We need to come to the table. We need to ensure people from various organized labor, uh, individuals who are working on this uh, trade deal, we do need fair trade. It will impact workers in other places. It will put our environment on jeopardy. And the most dangerous thing about uh, TPP, or one of the most dangerous things, is the investor state settlement courts. This is, uh, by example, TransCanada wants to sue the United States for not getting the Keystone XL pipeline uh, passed, something that Congressman Lance has supported in the past. Under TPP, if TPP is successful, Canada could actually sue the United States in, the, in these settlement courts and get away with it. Right now, they can't. The laws are in place to protect us. This is something that has to be renegotiated, and I'll be on the table to do it. Mr. Lance, would you like to comment, or would you like another question? Uh, I'll be pleased to comment. I think I just heard that uh, there was a suggestion that Republicans in the lame duck session of Congress would, would pass uh, the agreement uh, with Asia. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, so many of us oppose it in its current form. I think it would be extraordinary if we were to do that, and you have my pledge publicly, as I've said before, that I will not vote for it in lame duck. I don't think it should come up in lame duck because a new Congress will have been elected. And I think that the lame duck session of Congress should be quite limited because the people have spoken, electing new members in the Senate, new members in the House, a new configuration. And since both presidential candidates oppose it, I cannot imagine that President Obama whom Mr. Jacobs supports in large measure. I cannot imagine that President Obama would bring it up to Capitol Hill, but if he were to bring it up to Capitol Hill, there would not be Republican support for it, by and large, and you have my word that I would not vote for it. I do not think it's going to come up in lame duck, and if it were, I think it would be defeated, because whoever is president-elect opposes it as I oppose it. Thank you. 
We'll move on to regulation right now. Mr. Lance, you will have the first question. Business is overburdened with re regulation. The administration of President Obama has issued so many new regulations that businesses have had to devote precious resources from the business to regulatory compliance. Banks now have more compliance officers than they have loan officers. Much of this regulation has come via executive order rather than through legislation. Both candidates for president have indicated that they will continue to use executive orders if Congress will not act on their agenda. As a candidate for the office of Congress, do you believe your constitutional authority should be usurped in this manner? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, the Congress is the first branch of government, Article One. I think all presidents of the United States, regardless of political party, elide over that and immediately go to Article Two regarding the powers of the presidency. I, I'm not criticizing President Obama alone in that regard. I think this is historically what has happened, and I'm very much opposed to it. And it is clear beyond dispute that the Obama administration has governed by rule and regulation to a much greater extent than prior administrations, although it has happened in prior administrations, and I will oppose any attempt, either by Donald Trump or by Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, to pass rules and regulations that should be based upon statutory law, and it is only the Congress of the United States that can pass statutory law. Uh, regarding rules and regulations specifically, I have voted for the RAINS Act which says that if a rule or regulation has an impact of $100 million or more, that has to come before Congress. Now, that did not pass in the Senate of the United States. It passed in the House, but it not, did not pass in the Senate because of the filibuster in the Senate. It takes 60 votes to get anything done over in the Senate. I have come out publicly against the filibuster. I think the Senate should operate based upon the majority principle of 51 votes. If that had come up in the Senate with no filibuster, that would have passed, and we would have less regulation done by the executive branch of government in what I believe is an unconstitutional manner. Uh, number two, certainly there is overregulation, particularly regarding community banks under Dodd-Frank. Uh, the financial crisis was caused in large part by some of the larger financial institutions, but certainly not by community banks in this country. Community banks were in no way involved in the meltdown in 2008, and yet they are overburdened by regulation based upon Dodd-Frank, and at the very least, Dodd-Frank should be reformed so that community banks do not have to uh, have these onerous regulations. And I want to speak out on behalf of community banks here in North Central New Jersey, community banks in this state, and community banks across the country. This is also true of credit unions that are so helpful to many of our residents across the United States. Uh, we need fewer regulations. We need regulations that make common sense. We need uh, an act to say that if there is uh, an impact of $100 million or more, that it has to come before Congress. And based upon my strong belief in constitutionalism, and I have studied this my entire life and have been involved in this and have been involved in litigation in this area. No president, regardless of political party, uh, should enact statutory law, visa, rules and regulations. It's terrible. Presidents do it. And the new Congress should not permit it. Mr. Jacob, same question. Um, as a candidate for Congress, do you support um, Hillary Clinton's statement that she will use executive order if the Congress does not act? With regards to regulation, I think Congress needs to do, do their job. Ultimately, that is why you elect us, to go there and do our job. Um, regulations are a set of rules that exist and are put in place so we protect the common good. In 1929, as I mentioned earlier, we had the financial collapse led to the Great Depression. We put in three banking rules to protect our economy. The FDIC, the SEC, and Glass-Steagall, which was repealed in the late 90s. 50 years of progress and prosperity ensued after these regulations were put in place. I ultimately, I have to say that <clears throat> the problem here is not Dodd-Frank when it comes to banking revolution, uh, regulations. The problem is not Dodd-Frank. The problem is Wells Fargo. 
When you have a company, when you have a bank that opens up fraudulent accounts left and right, thank goodness under Dodd-Frank we had something called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that held them accountable. Young people, working families, senior citizens trusted this financial institution. And what did they do? They opened up a whole bunch of bank accounts in people's name, names, having not let them know, get informed about these actions. This is why we need regulations, not for the saints in the system, but for the sinners in the system. We need to protect the common good. And to respond to community banks, the reality here is, and Elizabeth Warren could uh, testified to this when she was sitting on the the Senate floor uh, with the president of the American Bankers Association she said what are you talking about community banks are not doing well they're actually doing better now since the regulations have been put in place they're, they they've had greater earnings the banks are doing better they've expanded uh, the definition of rural banking and credit unions to ensure people have access in those rural areas and the ABA president agreed with her Community banks are doing well. Yeah, we need to strengthen them. They need to be primary banking sources because those are the, those are the rel relationships that are fostered ultimately. Um, so the problem is not da Dodd-Frank. It's the bad actors in the system. And we need a Congress that actually does their job and protects the American people. Mr. Lance, would you like to respond? Uh, yes. I, I'm not sure I heard a response as to whether uh, uh, Mr. Jacob would support Hillary Clinton's a use of uh, executive order for rules and regulations, or Donald Trump's. I just think it's both candidates, and I've been concerned with what each of the candidates has said moving forward with rules and regulations without underlying statutory authority from us in the Congress. And I will oppose that because, based upon my reading of the Constitution, it is the Congress and the Congress exclusively that passes statutory law and therefore rules and regulations come under statutory law. No rule or regulation exists uh, by itself. It can only come into being based upon statutory law. Um, I speak with community bankers all the time and it's clear to me beyond dispute that community bankers are overburdened by new rules and regulations. Regarding Glass-Steagall, that was repealed by Bill Clinton in the late 1990s. Uh, I'm willing to look at it. I don't think we can go back completely to where we were before then, but I certainly do not want the taxpayers of this country to bail out investment banks or commercial banks, large entities that get into trouble. Uh, I don't like moral hazard. Bailing out one may lead to bad actions by others. I'm talking about the big banks here uh, because I think that it is inappropriate for the American people to be bailing out the big banks. Uh, and uh, as you know, to some extent that occurred after uh, the uh, crash in 2008, and I certainly do not want to see that again. I do not favor moral hazard where uh, one entity might look to another entity that has been bailed out by, by you and me, the taxpayers of this country, and, and think that it can get away with uh, action that is inappropriate. Uh, Rules and regulations should be based upon statutory law. That is my reading of the Constitution of the United States, and I will preserve the Constitution regardless of who sits in the Oval Office in the executive branch of government. Mr. Jacob, would you like to respond? Sure. Thanks, Jim. Pay attention to this conversation very carefully. What we often hear in Congress is using the guise of small banks and small businesses to protect the larger financial institutions pay very close attention to these conversations because by saying that small community banks um, are tied up with these great regulations, yeah, there may be some things with paperwork and things like that we need to address. They shouldn't be spending a bunch of time doing paperwork. Rather, they should be out serving the community. But much, much of this reform mainly has to do with undoing Dodd-Frank, undoing the financial regulations that are in place the financial regulations that have been put in place to prevent another financial collapse. For example, um, requiring that big banks hold higher levels of capital so we, the taxpayer, don't end up bailing them out. And as far as I know, we, the taxpayer, have not been bailed out yet. And eight years later, people are still working two or three jobs and wages have remained stagnant. Glass-Steagall works. It worked. And in fact, there's been a bipartisan effort in the Senate under uh, Senator John McCain and Senator Elizabeth Warren to ensure a modern-day Glass-Steagall, and that's something I would support. 
we can't delay the Volcker rule either. Paul Volcker, Volcker is the one who was responsible in the 80s, who was appointed by Jimmy Carter, but worked through the Reagan administration to ensure that we had a economy, we had a, uh, uh, an economy that worked for us. Um, and ultimately, the Volcker rule would reinforce Glass-Steagall. We can't have these banks act like casinos with our money. At the end of the day, when your IRA accounts, when your investments were lost, and our senior citizens who had these uh, retirement savings accounts lost their money in 2008, Social Security still paid every single penny on time. When banks gambled that away, their savings, their money that they worked hard for, Social Security still paid on time. Well, that is a nice segue because we are going to move on to discuss entitlements. The base of both your political parties oppose reform to entitlements, namely Social Security and Medicare. Both candidates for president oppose reforms to entitlement programs, and Mrs. Clinton talks about increasing benefits substantially. The Congressional Budget Office predicts that in 10 years, in 2026, entitlement payments and debt service will account for 96% of the federal budget. Can we continue as we are, or do we need to make substantial changes to our entitlement programs? Question comes to me first. Yes. Yeah. Um, I am a large supporter of Social Security. Again, in 1990, during the, uh, 1930, during the Great Depression, this is something that FDR put in place, and it's a system that's been working for 80 years now. The current Congress and Congressman Leonard Lance, who supports a budget that wants to privatize Social Security and voucherize Medicare, will not work. Two programs that work excellently. excellently. And if you ask the overwhelming majority of seniors who get Medicare, they support it. Social Security is there to protect us so we could retire with dignity. Social Security, the issue with Social Security could be simply, um, simply fixed by lifting the cap. The current cap on Social Security is $118,000. So you're not taxed into Social Security any point behind, uh, beyond that. So what that means is someone, one of my friends who makes $118,000, who does work in the financial industry, is paying the same amount into Social Security as David and Charles Koch are paying into Social Security. There's a major gap there. And we could, um, we could fix this insolvency issue by lifting the cap. And also keep in mind, in this conversation, something that's completely neglected is the fact that there is over uh, $2 trillion of a surplus that Social Security has. This, program, this, this is not something that's going to go away. Um, this is something that works. Social Security also doesn't contribute to the debt. Before Social Security, over 50% of seniors were in poverty, and today, uh, likewise, many seniors, uh, over 50% of them depend on Social Security as their primary form of income. That is something we need to protect. That is something that sets our nation apart from other nations because after a lifetime of work, you should be able to retire with dignity. And I haven't met someone who is a millionaire, um, and I've met a few in my life who said, there's not a problem. I don't mind paying my fair share into this to, to protect our economy as a whole. It does well for me because these people come out, go into, my, go into our communities, and they invest at the end day. We need to protect uh, the least one of us in our communities. And if it comes to taxing a billionaire or seeing a, a child go hungry tonight, I'd rather tax that billionaire at a fair share than see that child go hungry mm -hmm. tonight. Thank you. Mr. Lance, same question. Can we continue as we are, or do we need to reform? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I just heard a tax increase from my opponent. Uh, the uh, rate now is $118,000, and uh, as I heard my opponent, uh, he would raise taxes on people earning $119,000 or $120,000 or $121,000. Uh, <clears throat> there are many middle-class couples in this congressional district <clears throat> um, Two teachers, for example, <clears throat> perhaps they each earn uh, uh, seventy thousand dollars, seventy-five thousand dollars, after wonderful public service in our educational system in this state. Uh, their taxes would go up based upon what you've just heard. <clears throat> they're not billionaires. They're not millionaires. They're hardworking middle-class people in this congressional district. Very expensive to live in this congressional district. It's one of the most expensive 
uh, anywhere in the United States. And I'm not going to raise taxes on middle class people with family incomes of $120,000 or $130,000 or $135,000. But that doesn't get to the heart of your question, Jim, which is what should we do? I have voted to retain a Medicare Advantage which is a program that is critically important for senior citizens in this congressional district. I have supported legislation that is not yet law uh, to permit uh, Social Security benefits uh, to be computed based upon what senior citizens <coughs> actually purchase in goods and services. This would be helpful to senior citizens because they're not receiving much of an increase this year because how the formula is computed is not really based upon uh, what they purchase in goods and services, for example for medicines. Uh, but in the 1980s, under the leadership of Ronald Reagan, a Republican, and Tip O'Neill, a Democrat, uh, the President and the Congress came together and raised the retirement age modestly on Social Security for future generations, not for anywhere near retirement age, but for future generations. My retirement age was raised from 65 to 66. Some a little younger than I had a retirement age raised to 67. Perhaps we should look at raising the retirement age for people in their 20s and younger. That would not include Mr. Jacob. I believe you're 31, Mr. Jacob, so I'm not going to uh, have this affect you. People in their 20s, like our son, who is in his 20s, Heidi's son, our, our son, People in their 20s or a little younger might have to wait until they're 68 or 69 to receive full Social Security benefits. Now, I will be criticized that this is somehow a Social Security cut. I want this audience to decide for itself. If we tell people in their 20s and younger that they're going to have to wait one more year, is that a cut? I do not believe so. The fact is that so many in Washington demagogue this issue, I think we should look at a reform, a modest reform that I think would solve the problem. Would you like to respond to Mr. Lance's comments? And I want to respond to the first point with regards to the cost of living. The reality is the cost of living is very high in a state like New Jersey because you have various industries, the same industries that put money into the pocket of Congressman Leonard Lance's campaign fund to ensure there are loopholes that are maintained so they could go without paying taxes. Again, I pay taxes. My family, small business, we pay taxes because we care about our communities. And there are people out there, they don't mind paying a little bit more if in fact, and it's not a major amount. We're not talking about it's going to devastate your household. What we're talking about is something modest to benefit everybody. Okay, so it went from 65 to 67, then it becomes 69. As soon as you know it, you're working into your hundreds. Where does it stop? You worked a full time of your life. This is a nation that ensures people could retire with dignity. That is one of the staples of this country. You could work 40 hours a week on a single income at one point in this country's history, and you could retire in dignity. We see police officers, our firefighters who work hard, every day would their would their time spent working in the field with the tough work that they see our EMTs our nurses our physicians our social workers would their retirement ages also be bumped up that's the question we must ask there's just so long you could work as a human being and put that wear and tear on your body especially in those fields in those public service fields we need to protect people at the end of the day. This is an issue that could be easily solved by lifting the cap. We've done it in the past, and this is something we could consistently do to ensure we protect our entitlements, our Social Security, our future. Mr. Lance. Uh, yes, let me repeat, I'm not going to raise taxes on anybody in this congressional district uh, where a joint incomes of husband and wife are 120 or $130,000. I am opposed to that. Uh, number two, I suggested an increase in the retirement age by one year. Uh, it's just magically been transferred into 33 years from age 67 to age 100. Let me repeat, one year or perhaps two years, not 32 years, not 33 years. This is the sort of demagogic nonsense that exists so often in Washington and so often on the campaign trail. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to make sure that there is Social Security for future generations. Regarding Medicare, Hillary Clinton has suggested that Medicare be available for those between 55 and 65. The concern with that 
is that those likely in that age cohort to uh, utilize Medicare would be sicker than the population in general between age 55 and 65. This is not my thought. This comes from Professor Uwe Reinhardt at Princeton, the leading health economist in the United States, and he has analyzed Hillary Clinton's proposal regarding making Medicare possible, not mandatory, but possible for those between 55 and 65. My concern with that, I think it's uh, a proposal that it should be examined, but my concern with that is that it might further undermine Medicare at a time when we have to bolster Medicare. Thank you. Um, we will now move into the, the closing remarks. And the way that we do closing remarks is a little bit different than in most debates, and that is that I ask another question, which um, the candidates have no idea what I'm going to ask or have they prepared for it. But I think that what we're trying to do here is to get to their underlying um, philosophy to see what kind of representative they will be for us. So um, the country is polarized, and Mr. Lance, you are going to go first. Um, the country is polar polarized as it never has been before, at least in my lifetime. There is a belief that compromise is to surrender. We have gerrymandered our congressional districts in a manner that they are safe in the general election and thus very often controlled by the most radical elements in the respective parties in the primary. Congress reflects this polarization. On important issues, Democrats will not work with Republicans. Republicans will not work with Democrats. Congress will not work with the president. Nothing gets done and the American people are in contempt of their government. Whoever wins the White House, the polarization is likely to deepen. Will you be part of the problem or part of the solution? Uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank you again, Jim, for hosting this uh, debate, and I want to thank the audience for uh, your being here this morning. Um, I believe that we have to uh, do a better job in Washington, and I have tried to do that better job over the last seven and a half years when I have served in Congress. I have repeatedly had primaries in my own political party because I believe you can compromise on issues without compromising on your principles. And I have voted for budgets, including budgets that have been signed into law by President Obama when I believe they have been in the national interest. I voted against uh, some other budgets that uh, didn't comply with caps that had been placed in existence. But certainly, I have tried to be responsible in this regard. Regarding gerrymandering, we do not have gerrymandering in New Jersey because our state legislature does not uh, uh, determine the uh, congressional districts in this state. We have a bipartisan commission. It's in the New Jersey State Constitution, an equal number of Republicans and Democrats. And if they do not agree, the Supreme Court of New Jersey chooses a tiebreaker. And then that decision is made as to the configuration of the congressional districts. We have 12 congressional districts in New Jersey. Six are represented by Republicans. Six are represented by Democrats. Our system is better than the system that exists in most states across the country. Uh, the Luger Institute has said that I am more bipartisan than 90 percent of the members of the Congress of the United States. And I intend to continue to be bipartisan, as was my reputation when I was in Trenton. And I will work with whoever is president. Uh, if Donald Trump becomes president, I will work with him. I've given you my views where I think he should look to us in Congress for our expertise, particularly the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Brady, for example, and Speaker Ryan. If Hillary Clinton becomes president, I will work with her. And under no circumstances would I ever say that I cannot work with the new president of the United States. The issues that confront this country are too great for there to be continued partisan gridlock. I have tried to be somebody in Washington who brings about solutions working with others. I intend to continue to do that should I be reelected to the Congress, and I hope to be able to work with the new president. And if the new president is Hillary Clinton, and the polls indicate that she may become our new president, I hope she will move to the center as her husband was in the center. I hope she governs more like her husband than like President Obama, who has not had a particularly strong relationship with Congress. The issues of this country are so great that we have to work together. And the people of this congressional district have my pledge that I will do so. 
And proof of that is that I am more bipartisan than 90 percent of other members of Congress based upon the Luger Institute's analysis. Thank you very much for letting me participate this morning. Please, just hold it a little bit longer. <laughs> Mr. Jacob, you get the final word. Thank you, Jim, and thank you to each and every single one of you for being here today. Um, first, I'd like to say that my parents, they came to this country because they saw a nation which you could work hard. And after a week's worth of work, after putting in 40 hours a week, you could save money for a home, buy a car, buy a television. It was a big deal back then. You could buy, uh, take your family out on vacations. Uh, they saw a nation in which you could retire with dignity with Social Security. They saw a nation that put a man on the moon. Uh, and they saw a nation in which if your son or daughter studied hard, they could become doctors, lawyers, engineers, or at the very least a poor politician. Um, we need a government that works. And government is not, as many of the demagogues put it, many people put it, it's this far off boogeyman entity. No, we make the government. Government is a tool. And if we're serious about fixing our government, we have to change our Congress. There is too much effort put into obstructionism these days. And President Obama, I believe he came in with good faith. If you read his books, he talks about working across the aisle. But eight years, and we've had very little accomplished. If we look at a time when Ronald Reagan served with Tip O'Neill, yeah, they'd had fierce debates on the Senate and House floor. But at the end of the day, they could go out to lunch and dinner, and they could get along. We need to foster those relationships. And who better than a social worker to foster those type of relationships in Congress, right? Gerrymandering, to address this point, it is a reality. I mean, if I got a dollar every single time that someone in the township of Union in Union County was surprised that someone in the Union Township in Hunterdon County knew that we were in the same district, if I raised a dollar every single time I heard uh, surprised with that, I could stop fundraising, you know, honestly. It is a gerrymandered district. You don't go from Union all the way up to uh, Warren, all the way down to Montgomery, then the border of Pennsylvania and not call it gerrymandering. Believe me, I love the people, especially the beautiful people out in Warren and Hunterdon County. Nothing beats the clean air, uh, water, or the people in those places. But we need a government that's truly representative and we need to protect our democracy. And when a district leans for the right, it doesn't enable democracy to happen. This is what forces our parties to become so partisan. We are in a country now where it says, where there are people who say, we can't afford to give people health care. We can't afford to give people education. But we could afford corporate handouts. When it, has it ever been in the American spirit to say, we can't afford something? I recommend and I suggest we do better as a nation. But the struggles will be difficult. And I know that I may not see the promised land to ensure these things for future generations. But I will fight for it because we need people with, with vision in our Congress, people who look beyond the profit lines of corporations, but look towards tomorrow. And so I'd like to conclude with the words that I think brought people like Dwight Eisenhower, uh, that brought Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, uh, LBJ, and people like Millicent Fenwick together. And that vision, I think, was encompassed in the words of John F. Kennedy while he stood at Rice University in 1962, I believe. And he looked out into the crowd of students, uh, professors, administrators, and even the janitors came out to hear John F. Kennedy speak. And JFK looked out and said, we go to the moon and do the other things not because they're easy, but because they are hard. Because by setting that goal, we serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and our skills. It is a challenge, one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. On November 8th, I ask you to look carefully because we intend to win on November 8th. Thank you. All right, go ahead and clap.
So I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. I want to thank Mr. Lance and Mr. Jacob for participating in, in what I think is a very, very important discussion. But mostly I want to thank all of you for taking the time to attend and to be attentive and to be courteous. Um, if we compare this with many, many other debates that we have seen, <laughs> this one wins Not hands to down. Any names. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for coming. Great job. Congressman.